Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the webinar on climate finance for cities and buildings and climate-related mechanisms to support sustainable public procurement. Uh, my name is Irina Uzun, and I'm a consultant at the UNEP Division of Technology, Industry and Economics uh, office in Paris. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, my colleague, Mr. Farid Yaker, uh, UNEP program officer in charge of the SPP program, uh, among other things. He will greet you uh, in just a moment. Uh, before we start, though, I would like to briefly uh, give you an introduction to the GoToWebinar tool. Uh, if you have never used it before. So all attendees are on uh, listen-only mode. You are muted. Uh, this is normal. Um, so if throughout the course of the pre presentation you have um, a question or a comment, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, there is a button on the GoToWebinar control panel that will enable you to raise your hand uh, and will go to your question in, in due time. Otherwise, there is a question box in which you can type your question and we'll be able to read, to read it and answer it out loud. The presentation will last uh, for about 50 minutes and then we will have um, a questions and answers session at the end. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we'll make uh, the recording available on the 10 PSPP programs library of webinars on sustainable public procurement hosted uh, through the SCP Greenhouse YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention. And without further delay, I would like to hand over the floor to Mr. Yaker for some welcome remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Farid Yaker from UNEP. And I welcome you for this webinar hosted by the UNEP Division of Technology, Industry and Economics. It is our first joint webinar organized with our colleagues from the Sustainable Buildings and Construction Program of the 10-year framework of programs. For those of you who don't know the 10 years framework of program, I will be presenting it later. And our colleagues are also representing the Global Initiative for Resource-Efficient Cities, which is a, a team here in UNEP working on urban issues. And I myself and Irina are representing the Sustainable Public Procurement Team of UNEP and also the 10-year, the Sustainable Public Program of the 10-year framework of programs. This webinar will be dedicated to, or we focus on the climate finance tools on the one hand, and also on the use of climate-related mechanisms to support sustainable public procurement at the local level. Next one. Okay. I hope you all have the presentation on your screen. Next one. Okay. Um, what about the? I wanted to t say a word about the 10-year framework of programs. So this framework has been adopted at the Rio Plus 20 summit in 2012, and its objective is to accelerate the shift towards sustainable consumption and production. The shift towards sustainable patterns of consumption and production. So the program supports capacity building and provides technical and financial assistance to developing, to developing countries for this shift. And so far, it has six programs. It has validated, approved six programs, which are consumer information programs, sustainable lifestyles and education, sustainable public procurement, sustainable buildings and construction, sustainable tourism, including ecotourism, and sustainable food systems. So today, we're organizing this webinar together or with our colleagues from the Sustainable Buildings and Construction, and we're representing ourselves the Sustainable Public Procurement Program. For those of you who want to know more about this 10YFP, 10-year framework of program, uh, you have the, the link 
at the bottom of the slide so you can visit and discover you know all about it we also want to take the opportunity to present our colleagues from the climate technology center and network which is the operational arm of the unf ccc technology mechanism their mission is to stimulate technology cooperation and enhance the development and deployment of technologies in developing countries so basically they provide technical assistance to developing countries at their request and, and they also assist on a wide range of technologies and sectors related to buildings and cities for example in the fields of transportation building waste disaster management efficient lighting refrigerant technologies monitoring of emissions at city level etc for more information you also have the link uh, at the bottom of the slide. Now I would like to take this opportunity to present our panelists. And first of all, Mr. Stefan Poufari, who is the founder, honorary president of the, N the NGO Energies 2050. He has been working in the field of, field of international cooperation for over 25 years and has contributed to the design of national and regional policies on climate finance and energy efficiency renewables finance mechanism. He is author of numerous reports, studies, and articles on climate change, sustainable development, renewable energies, energy efficiency, building and construction sectors, and cities and territorial challenges. Stefan will be presenting, presenting the handbook on climate finance for cities and buildings that is basically designed for local governments. Then we will have a presentation from Mr. Kevin Kempshire, who is the director of the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings at the US General Services Administration, GSA. Mr. Mr. Kempshire has created the framework for which GSA responds to the challenges of greenhouse gas emissions reductions and of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act mandate to move GSA's federal building inventory towards high performance for green buildings. He has devised a challenge for companies to dramatically improve the government's ability to achieve deep retro retrofits through energy savings performance contracts. And he will be delivering a presentation entitled Public and Private Partnerships and Their Implications for Climate Change Mitigation on a Portfolio Scale. And last but not least, our friend Mr. Pekka Huovila, who is a consultant at the Ministry of the Environment of Finland, he currently coordinates the 10 YFP Sustainable Buildings and Construction Program for the Finnish Ministry of the, of the Environment. He has had major responsibility in 25 international development projects on sustainability of the built environment during the past 10 years. And he has worked extensively on sustainable city development projects in China, Colombia, Egypt, Kenya, Libya, Malaysia, Morocco, Tanzania, and Zambia. Pekka will be delivering a presentation entitled Procurement of sustainable buildings using core indicators to establish a quantitative basis. So I'd like to thank our panelists for their presence today. And it's really a, a great privilege to have them all uh, in our webinar. And without further delay, I will give the floor to Stefan for the first presentation. Hello, hello, everybody. So um, it's a great pleasure to be there today and uh, and to have the opportunity to deliver some uh, some uh, let's say information regarding a, uh, a deep project we have conducted within UNEP and uh, in partnership on the climate finance dedicated to local governments. So uh, okay. So so uh, uh, as we don't have a lot of time, so I will just go very fast about the, the NGO. But we are working on project uh, policy financing and also we are working so far for example on the ENDC to be developed for the COP21 so for those who are interested we can definitely change after the webinar and uh, regarding regarding also the the cities also I'm um, just trying to explain you that there will be a big events in the roadmap to Paris in Nice uh, end of June and also with partners like UNEP, GEREC and others as you see also the SCP program. 
So going back also today to my presentation, I will give some insights about the Urban Carbon Mechanism Handbook for Local Policy Makers we have developed last year. And uh, this piece of work is um, also con on behalf of UNEP SBCI and is connected also with the Resource Efficient City Initiative of UNEP and some other worldwide. And the point was to, to make some connection within the city, let's say, level and the opportunities to offered by climate finance and all carbon, let's say, mechanism. And uh, we will see just after that the, let's say, the climate change negotiation process reinforce this opportunity at this level. And uh, definitely we need to focus on this kind of added value for, for working on abatement and also adaptation at the city level. So the objective of this handbook was to help local governments to have, an, uh, let's say, inspiration about how they can scale up some initiative thanks to carbon finance. So first of all, I will just give one, one or two words regarding the international climate change context. Maybe all of you, let's say, mostly know the situation, but this is quite inspiring now because we all know late this year we hopefully will have a banking agreement with very ambitious target and also to be concrete enough to put in place, let's say, a roadmap to implementation for the next COP in Marrakech less, next year. But also the process is very interesting because all the countries are supposed to provide INDC. And for those who don't know, INDC, it's a, a self it means that country will deliver what they can provide on the, let's say, mitigation, but also on adaptation needs. And thanks for the developing countries to also requ request and have some external support. And within the INDC, because it's a long, let's say, vision perspective strategy development for countries, and uh, most of them, and for those who have already published their INDC, put some emphasis on sectoral approach, such as building and cities. And what is very interesting is that developing countries, so far the ones who have published their INDC for, for Morocco, for Mexico, they have put really an emphasis on the built environment. So just to say that this is something new and to make some, let's say, transversal sectorial and systemic approach, globally speaking, about cities to be more at the forefront of the negotiation process and all the financing and carbon mechanism can be at the end closely linked with this process. So, and also I just want to give an emphasis because it's connected with the book and the report we have produced that MRV, so Measuring Reporting Notification, the IND. So it's not a new item on the context of the negotiation process, but it is something to be really now at the forefront. And it's interesting because it means that everything we are going to commit will have to be, let's say, back to back with a process to be in position to let's say, demonstrate the reality of the mitigation, to demonstrate also the reality of the need of adaptation and the need to support, thanks to some finance, finance let's say, tools and or technical transfer and all, you know, to, to reinforce capacities. But at the end, everything has to be transparent enough to be, to be monitored and to be, let's say, evaluated to, at the end, globally speaking, be on the trends to the two degree Celsius window. So, going back to the, let's say, report itself, it, it's, the, the starting point is an observation about the buildings and cities at the end, let's say, challenge and opportunities, that at the end, they are, let's say, part of the story about the, uh, let's say, emission. This is true for the buildings, at least 40%, globally speaking. For the city, is 75%, so same for resource, let's say, consumption. And also, they, they, deliver, they, they can deliver a huge, let's say, part of abatement. So this is the, the first point. Secondly, the, the second, let's say, observation is that regarding the baseline, the situation of reference, they have faced a lot of, let's say, contradictory and difficulties to demonstrate what can be the situation to consider as a starting point and to create additionality. So this is something very important on both sectors because it is not only a question of technology, but it's a question also how we are going to use a building, how we are going to also deliver the service for cities, or we are going to use resources. So at the end, it is a global picture to say this is quite difficult to have this kind of approach, but this is needed, you have already understood, within the negotiation, let's say, climate change conference and context, but also basically because we will need to demonstrate additionality. So, 
regarding the cities also and also the buildings i would just want to emphasize one small data and people know that but it's very important to to remind that that we are going to have some trends quite unique nobody has experienced such a fast let's say trends regarding cities for example in the let's say the next 15 years we will have two in additional billion urban inhabitants worldwide and especially for example in africa where there will be more than 40,000 new urban inhabitants per day in the next decade. So it means we need also to avoid, let's say, locking effect. And it's quite important because if we miss the point today, we will face a lot of difficulties, at least to refurbish whatever we consider buildings and or cities, but also to, let's say, consider new inhabitants, new entry persons. So this is the point, let's say, the, the, the observation, the starting point. Regarding also the uh, greenhouse gases emissions, the, 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 the difficulties I already mentioned is to have, let's say, a clear vision, to be in position to have the assessments and the inventory enough, clear, to, to put, let's say, and to track after the additional, let's say, um, improvements you are going to put on buildings and or cities. So this is something rather difficult. We have now a protocol, thanks to ICLEI, UNEP, and some other partners. It has been launched in Lima last year, but it has to be improved and also to be enough size for small size cities. Going back to MRV for cities, you have already understood, this is definitely something very important. And I would say we, we need also to consider MRV, let's say, in a, in a transition process, because we know data requirement will be crucial. We know also we, we will need to educate third party auditings. We need to be in position to connect, let's say, funds and to connect policy and to connect, let's say, uh, all the subsidies and support mechanisms to, to be fair enough to demonstrate additionality to these sectors. But this is something crucial. So going back now to the, sorry, I have problem with my slide. Yes, about the carbon finance and the climate mechanism. Something also we need all to, to consider is that by the past, it was, let's say, the story about the CDM. We, we, we know that the building sectors and definitely the city sectors were definitely underrepresented. This is clear and it, it can be, let's say, for the consideration I already explained, it can be the same for the next period. So we need to definitely be in position to incorporate cities and buildings in the climate, let's say, mechanism, and also the climate finance mechanism, as well as the carbon mechanism. So, sorry, I have problems. So in, in the report, we have review, and you can all have access to these documents and also to the best practice we have evaluated. So, but to, to, to try to define the limits of all the existing mechanisms. So we all know the CDM as well as the POA, the program of activities, and some of them are technology oriented, even if they improve the methodology. And now we are also working and design new CD wide POA as well as NAMA. So it's not dream because some countries already deliver some NAMA. We have some example in Tunisia in the building sectors. We have also something in Mexico on the building sectors. And now we have also a new NAMA and, okay, to, be, to be designed very soon uh, within Tunisia. So just to say this is an ongoing process and all the tools are improving to, most, to mostly de better deliver the built environment. So as the time is running out of, I will just go to my conclusion because the last point was to give one or two examples. So going back to the, to the global picture of building and cities in a climate change perspective, we need to transform knowledge into action. So now we need to, to, as soon as we design a project, to be in position to measure the performance. So it's create additional works, but definitely will create additional value. And also, because there is a new trend about policy, as I was speaking about INDC, this is also a very good opportunity to put the emphasis on buildings and cities. We all know cities are already part of the climate change agenda because we have some city days now. And now maybe the point also is to deliver some city or end buildings days and to be in position to put at the upfront of the climate change agenda these two sectors to at the end connect with new, let's say, mechanisms under the Green Climate Fund, for example, for financing, as well as new mechanisms, the so-called new market mechanism to be delivered for the building and city environment. So thank you, and I would be glad to answer any kind of question after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now let the floor is uh, to Mr. Kevin Kamshore.
Kevin? Good morning, and thank you for inviting me here. I am delighted to be here from the United States. And uh, <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Um, and the next one. So I wanted to talk about two examples of, um, maybe one too far, two examples of the uh, kinds of uh, contracts called performance contracts. Now in the past, um, most, uh, certainly in the United States, most uh, contracts for construction, whether it's new construction or renovation, were very prescriptive. That is to say, we describe exactly what we want and in many cases how to achieve it. Um, this is the way traditionally building codes are written and you end up with a, an effort on the part of the contractors and the constructors to uh, perform the minimum amount uh, required to meet the code or to meet the contract specifications. And what we're trying to achieve by this change is an approach that gives you maximum performance. A performance contract is easier to write, easier to administer, but it does require more thinking up front. And today I will talk about two options here. One, uh, a traditional contract where the government pays up front, but performance guarantees are included. And a second one where the um, uh, contract is, uh, capital of the contract is actually paid for uh, by private capital and the government uh, pays back the investment in its own assets with a uh, payment scheme based entirely on the savings in energy and water. So next page. The um, value of uh, making this change in procurement is um, considerable because it simplifies uh, the procurement, but it also forces a change in behavior and the procurement itself becomes a change agent. Um, the main ancillary value is that there is no way for, for either party to succeed in this kind of arrangement unless there's a complete integration of goals and delivery. So the example that you're seeing in the picture on the right was a contract for $340 million US for a, an office building in Denver, Colorado, uh, which was constructed with not one single change order during the entire uh, contract and very, very clear performance specifications about uh, what the uh, program of the building needed to be, what kind of functions needed to be in the building, and the conclusion was they achieved a, a net zero energy building uh, with no additional cost uh, compared to a standard building in the, in the market there. And the key was to say to the constructor from the government, here is our budget, that's all the money we have, but here are our goals and we will award the contract to the team that achieves the goals um, uh, the most uh, in, in towards our program. So next. In um, an energy savings contract, the uh, financing is very different and what you see on the left is before the, the, the contract and you have a certain number of payments that are going to the utility providers. This represents the total amount of money available over time to pay back, then the, the concept is that a private entity comes into the building, does an, edit, an audit, chooses a series of energy conservation measures, the government agrees to those energy conservation measures, signs the contract, and then after the, the energy conservation measures take place, uh, there's a lower payment to the utilities and the differential between the previous payment and the new payment is what goes back to the company and you pay for uh, financing, you pay for the capital and you pay for the operation and maintenance out of that differential. The other key to the, the way these contracts work is that if the savings do not materialize, that is to say 
if a uh, constructor says you will save one million dollars a year in energy savings and you only end up saving nine hundred million dollars a year the government only pays nine hundred million dollars or nine million dollars a year rather than the the nine hundred thousand you get the idea I'm sorry for uh, fumbling there so if the savings are lower and uh, you only pay the amount of the actual savings not the amount of the projected savings next so uh, we believe that you can achieve deep energy retrofits using this process provided that you have um, very very strong uh, involvement of the building owner and in this case the uh, general services administration on behalf of the US federal government owns you know 1800 buildings and 36 million square meters of space and so we are able to look over the entire portfolio and select those buildings that are most capable for achieving deep energy retrofits but it, again it requires integrative design for example if you just look at the mechanical system of the building you might say well I can make a new chiller and a new boiler and I can use condensing boilers and I can use uh, maybe ground source heat pumps and resize the uh, everything for a savings of 15 to 20 percent however let's assume that you also look at the building and you discover that there's very little insulation you devise a method for adding insulation on the interior of a historic building and then you reduce the load by such a significant amount that you no longer are buying the same size chillers and the same size boilers you're buying something much smaller which increases the amount of efficiency and has the side benefit of lowering the amount of capital so it is extremely important to look at the entire building with this the, the advancements today in modeling, in energy modeling tools and auditing provide the tools necessary to do this. A key component of this form of contract is that there is an ongoing M&V or measurement and verification process. So for us, we look every single year to make sure that the annual savings are exactly equal to or greater than what was predicted. Our experience with this kind of uh, contract is very positive. 98% of all of the contracts that we have awarded like this over the last 20 years are exceeding the predicted energy savings. And they are also exceeding the cost savings that have been estimated. So we have two guarantees. One is a cost saving guarantee and the other one is an energy or greenhouse gas saving uh, guarantee and and these contracts do better than predicted on both uh, uh, both measures the last uh, point I would like to make is that it's extremely important that the occupants be engaged in the decision-making process in the beginning as well as uh, the ongoing operation of the building so uh, we'll move then to the next slide and I have then some examples of specific buildings that are done uh, with these two firms. Uh, but first, I show you just briefly that it, what I don't wish to go into the details here, but you get the idea that every single possible thing you can do to the building, whether it's cogeneration, renewable heat, piping distribution, and the obvious ones of lighting. Are, uh, are available and have been included and this just shows the distribution over time of what kinds of things we do in buildings. Next. Next slide. So this building is the Edith Green building in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, it was one of the performance contracts where we asked the uh, contractor to redo a design based on uh, goals that we set for the building and had a fixed budget for that. If we can go to the next slide, the 
uh, building was originally designed to take care of a facade problem. It was a leaking facade, both water and air infiltration and deterioration of the structure and you can see here the uh, reconstruction process. One of the key things that the integrated design do, did was say you know the uh, exposure to the sun is very different from the different points of the compass so the building is designed separately each facade has a different construction to uh, react to the sun and to the light in a more effective way. Next. It also uh, changed from a uh, air-based system to a water-based system, uh, reducing the load from the envelope, changing the interior load to radiant heating and cooling from an air-based system, which is more common in the United States, raising the ceiling because of the elimination of the ductwork enabled uh, greater light penetration from windows, which enabled a lowering of the lighting load by 50 uh, percent. And, and in addition, from a purely real estate point of view, uh, gave more space for each um, uh, kind of uh, uh, each floor uh, to the equivalent of one extra floor. And from a climate change perspective, that is a uh, huge bonus because that means that we're using less space and less energy for the same number of people. Next. Um, and you can see a little bit there. We also looked very carefully at the rainwater. We created a cistern from a firing range and we're using no potable water for either chillers or landscape watering and so on. So I will give another example here. Next page. So this is the uh, Federal Center South, which was partially a renovation and partially a new building. Next uh, page. And uh, in, this, in this building, uh, we use 75% less energy than the average building uh, in the United States. Um, and another example of the kind of integrative thinking that is extremely positive is that the soil is very, as you can see, it's next to the water. It was very um, soft and clay-like, so it required very deep foundations. So in Inside the foundations, uh, we put geothermal wells to use ground source heat pumps to um, uh, heat and cool the building and at the same time restore the wetlands that were, were next to there. We completely reused all the timbers in the existing building and the key to this particular project was that there was a performance guarantee in the project for one year after the uh, delivery of the building so the entire team stayed on to make sure that the building continued to work as designed and the, the guarantee was tied to the fee that we paid to the team that built the building. Next page. And the next several slides just show interior pictures of the building. We'll go to the next page uh, very quickly. Next page. And here you see all of the timbers that were reused from the existing building. And now we're moving to an energy savings performance contract where we took an existing building and uh, renovated it entirely to net zero. And the net zero uh, was enabled by the solar panels you see in the upper left-hand corner. And the pictures are, are very much of the, the, the ordinary and prosaic uh, things that you need to do, uh, changing out the electrical distribution switch gear in the lower left, and, uh, and clearly changing to, again, a water-based system for heating and cooling. Next page. And you can see in this next page a list of the uh, things that were done there. Uh, in, and they're very, very standard things. And again, $6.4 million of investment, 100% um, uh, performed by uh, Schneider Electric uh, Company with a 19-year contract saving $13 million a year, uh, $13 million in energy savings. And um, that is the uh, source for repaying the $6.4 million investment. Next page. And my uh, last example here is um, a 
1995 building, well, there's actually a pair of buildings, both of roughly the same vintage, where we achieved 62% energy reduction. Now, in the United States, the average reduction from an energy savings performance contract typically is 18%. So you can see this is much, much greater performance than average. Uh, in Germany, I understand from uh, colleagues there that the average performance is closer to 40%, but our goal is to achieve over 50%. And here, you can see this is not an old building. It's not particularly bad, but yet there was still this much inefficiency in the building that we could change. Next page. And you see the um, types of things that were done, and this is the other building that was included. It's uh, right now the metro. It's in, in Silver Spring, and the two buildings were together. Now, actually, bundling buildings together is an important aspect of making these um, contracts work on a portfolio basis because the firms with whom you are dealing prefer to have the larger contracts rather than the shorter. So next page. Um, and uh, you can see the list of things. We reduced over 20,000 tons of greenhouse gas uh, per year. First year savings of nearly $3 million and uh, one megawatt of uh, on-site renewable and a switch to geothermal uh, technologies and the complete change of 11,000 lighting fixtures to uh, light emitting diodes and the rest that you can see. And next page for the final slide here so I can keep on time. Um, it, the timing is the key and one of the advantages in a, a portfolio approach is to make sure that you go through the inventory in the portfolio, look for opportunities uh, which will come up normally. Uh, the equipment is getting old and is due to replacement, the code is changed and you need to do upgrades or the building is just consuming a tremendous amount. So the selection of buildings is a, a key component to that. And with that, I will conclude and look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, Pekka? Yeah. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, Americas. Good evening, Asia. Great pleasure of being here. I think we can start directly from the slide two. In my presentation, I intend to, if you can move on to the next slide, uh, like to start from what we mean by sustainable buildings, then to discuss a bit how innovation and sustainability can be included in procurement, and then say some words about the certification schemes that are often used there when talking about sustainable buildings, and uh, then the topic about can we assess sustainability of the buildings by using just a very small number of science-based standardization supported core indicators and I show some case studies this energy focused on a new office building uh, uh, in, in Kenya recently and some words about the future development especially with the help of building information modeling. Next slide please. Um, as a starting point from our program that we recently launched, this Sustainable Buildings and Construction program under the 10th year framework pro programs, um, people often refer to buildings that have major negative impacts on the environment, what comes to, to raw material use, emissions and also impacts on biodiversity, but we'd like to underline that also the sector can play an important role in cleaning polluted areas and also using the waste streams of other sectors. Also buildings contribute to the human health and safety and construction activities like in the developing countries they provide opportunities for employment both genders and also to the youth which is very important there and it's also an important share of the national wealth. Next slide please. Uh, the standard define the sustainable buildings about uh, bringing the required performance with the minimal adverse environmental impacts and at the same time encouraging improvements in economic, social and cultural aspects at the local and global levels. 
what is important here is that it's not only when we talk about sustainability to minimize these environmental impacts, but also to look at the performance, the value that will be delivered. And the specific features in buildings is that they have a long service life from 40 to 100 years, even hundreds of years, which is very different compared to the commodity products. Also, they need to adapt the changing needs of their changing users over time, and that underlines a lot of the operation maintenance phase. How are they uh, operated, how they are maintained, and that has also linked with the, how they are procured. Next slide, please. I have here a very simple classification of three types of procurement um, methods or contracts. The first one there, what I call as client-driven, is the prescriptive that also Kevin talked about. Typically, it means that the client defines the solutions and asks who is going to deliver it at the lowest price. That uh, prevailing, dominating practice doesn't give leave much space for innovation because the client has already fixed most of the solutions. If the client knows is an expert, knows all the best solutions, then it's, it's fine, but if there is also opportunity for the suppliers for developing their services, then this second column, what I call as supplier-supported or performance-based contracting, that can also include these uh, life cycle aspects that were also mentioned in the previous presentation, like if the supplier takes care of, like Schneider in the in the example for 19 years about operation, then they actually, the team selects solutions that are then easy to maintain, that last long, and also are emitting little. Then the third category, which I call as collaborative models, which may mean partnering. Typically, the contracts are put together once uh, in one out of five cases, which means that uh, the same team doesn't continue for the same client. The designers, the main contractors or subcontractors, they are gathered together in each and every individual project, which means that the learning curve is not always so long, so, so positive, like in the case of alliance contracting where you can continue, or then that what we call as integrated project delivery, which is mainly meaning here that with the help of, of building information models, you can simulate the performance of the building during the design phase and actually the design changes or iterations are done early in the project where the cost consequences are not so big. So that gives an opportunity of also monitoring online during the design, which are the choices that people are, are choosing. Next slide, please. Then talking about this uh, certification that should come in the next slide. This is one example of those certification schemes, CASB from, from Japan, that is following this eco-efficiency formula, what I tried to mention in, in this ISO standard. So there's some output, some performance, some value that is procured, and then, then that is compared against the environmental loads. And this gives out a ratio where the environmental quality and performance is measured against environmental loading. Next slide, please. One issue here is the boundary conditions. Where's the demarcation line? Do we talk about the building envelope also for the building site? Do we talk about groups of buildings? Can we use like distributed energy systems? Can we use local production, etc.? This is an issue that comes into question when thinking about the optimizing sustainability. Often the building is not the optimal unit. You should have a rather neighborhood or, or bigger scale. However, the other slide showed there how the uh, traditional way of constructing has led into more energy intensive, more emitting solutions, providing modern buildings. And now we are going back to to look at the environmental loads there, how you can achieve the required performance with the minimal loads. There's another example, if you change the slide to the German system, DGNB. Next slide. This is uh, one of the recent examples of certification schemes where they have ecological quality, economical quality, social, cultural, functional quality, 
and technical quality. So they, they want to base that assessment scheme based on the three pillars of sustainability, also looking at the process issues, and that consists of 51 indicators. Then thinking about how can we reduce the number of indicators, how can we uh, achieve reliable results by just a few number of, of metrics that are also relevant in the location, the country in question. And what was done or has been done by Sustainable Building Alliance was, in the next slide, a pro proposal to look at only, see, well that is still an example of the certification schemes as you see on the line, this is uh, on the average these certifications are leading into improvement on sustainability, this is an energy assessment, but in some cases individual buildings actually can consume even much more than the building regulations allow, so the certification today it doesn't always mean that the certified buildings would be high, highly sustainable. But then to the next slide, to these core indicators. Can simply think about resources from energy and water point of view, then the emissions from the greenhouse gases and wastes, and then what is the performance on indoor environment what will be delivered there. Is it thermal comfort and indoor air quality? Next slide. If we take example of these six categories, we can go for 10 indicators, just use energy, primary energy in kilowatt hours, greenhouse gases in CO2 emissions, water cubic meters, and then different types of waste, and then look at these thermal comfort. So that is one possibility of having an good representation of the performance of the building from the environmental sustainable point of view. And then in addition to these six main indicators or, or ten individual units, some local aspects could be added. Next slide please. These indicators are mainly standardized. You can find the, the ways of, of how to achieve info, access to information and how to assess it. This is a case study I was involved in writing a handbook for UN on how to procure sustainable buildings. And one of the case studies was in Nairobi in a new office building. And the original objective for UN was to achieve a climate neutral building, meaning that the building should uh, produce its energy, including the embodied part, and, and, and act perform like that. Actually, that was, seemed to be a bit over-ambitious, and then the lower target was energy neutral building, meaning that the embodied part was not counted, but the building should produce the energy it's using. When the design was completed, they estimated the energy consumption that was 147 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, that was actually quite high. Uh, I, I didn't hear these American examples, what was the baseline? You said there was a reduction of 62% or something, but I don't know compared to what. Anyway, this is a new building and uh, after UNEP's consultation they were able to lower it down to 120 and the next phase was my turn to visit the site, interview the designers, contractors and also the FM people there and see how the offices is working and I recommend it that they can easily uh, set down the target for 70 kilowatt hours but that can be halved again so go for 35 if you take into consideration all the office equipment and how the building is operated and based on that UN set the new objective from 150 to 120 they turn to aim at 30 kilowatt hours per square meter and actually the measured consumption in operation has been around 40, 40 kilowatt hours. You see there in the bottom that it's producing 150 percent of the energy it's using and the reason of how that was achieved it was not only natural lighting or natural ventilation it was also office equipment, centralized cafeteria, it was uh, no elevators for, for people there, it was uh, uh, server room that didn't need cooling because it was put outside 
And also what is important there in this environment is that in, in Kenya they have something like 60 days per year of power cuts, which means that the diesel generators are automatically switching on when there's a power cut. But this building doesn't need that and can even supply the neighboring building because it's producing the, the energy it's needing. Then next please. Just a word on this building smart approach. Actually, today, the core metrics I, I mentioned earlier, these six metrics, they can be defined into industry foundation classes. There's a ISC property sets existing for them, or you can define them, and that means that when you do the, your building using BIM, you can already provide input for life cycle assessment. And then if you use those LCA modules with the already existing commercial design software, you can do the life cycle assessment based estimation of the of the design and do the optimization at that phase. And also the producers of materials and products, they are able to provide these core metrics in many cases, which means that, that you can have more accurate estimation of the consumption in use today if you start to think about how to, to design the building and then who are the partners that can supply the information needed for that. And then the last slide I have to conclude is dealing with the how to procure sustainable buildings. I'm proposing the approach to use just a small set of core indicators to establish some quantitative baseline. You have to set the measurable targets. You have to, to quantify where, what you aim at then in operation. You have to monitor and you have to verify if the building is not performing as you have designed, then you have to do something. The, either the use is different or something is not properly adjusted. This is often a thing that is not always done so well. So you, you, it may take up to three years uh, to be able to, to adjust the building to perform as it was designed. And then to have more reliable results, I support, uh, propose this standardization supported science-based assessment and then use accessible data and, and then also communicate what you have achieved. So this was my presentation of setting the quantitative baseline using small sets of core indicators. Thank you. Happy to answer the questions you might have. Thank you, Peter. Well, I think we should thank our uh, three speakers for uh, really excellent and very enlightening presentations. Thank you, Stefan, for uh, this handbook and for presenting all these finance tools that we're really going to need. And I can see that you have a, a great experience and you're sharing it. And we hope that uh, many people will uh, download the guide. Kevin, you did a wonderful job of presenting uh, those excellent examples of uh, GSE. And really, I can say these are powerful examples, well presented. And uh, thanks, Pekka, for uh, maybe concentrating on the how we should do this uh, sustainable procurement of green buildings and uh, really highlighting those uh, excellent examples. And among them, uh, what the UN is doing, and I was happy that you could also show uh, that the UN is walking the talk in this field. And uh, continuing on that, I would like to announce that uh, we are going to, uh, we're working currently on developing procurement guidelines for green and sustainable buildings. So uh, keep it informed that uh, hopefully within uh, six months, the UN will be publishing those guidelines and we will need the expertise of uh, everyone to be sure that we produce really useful and, and val valuable guidelines. Uh, we are now ready to move to the question session and uh, I will let Irina manage that part. Okay, thank you, Fareed. Um... Let's go to the question. I have um, Grace Stead who has raised her hand. I will unmute you. And you have to unmute yourself. Grace, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I have John. 
Can you hear me? You're unmuted. Yes. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. John Humphrey, I work for the Forest Stewardship Council. So it's probably all very obvious that I want to ask something about wood. Uh, to both Mr. Kamshoy and uh, Mr. Wolf Villa. Uh, so when it's first about US and refitting wet building, how important is the replacement of other building materials uh, with wood in the total concept? Same question for Mr. Wavila, but for Mr. Wavila, I have an additional question. You mentioned at some point <coughs> that, that as a, a public a public procurer, you also have to set boundaries for <coughs> what is the what what is the um, dimension that you want to uh, take into account when you talk about sustainable buildings. You mentioned that you can go beyond individual buildings, local environment, but isn't it so? That particularly public procurers in Europe and across the world, when it com comes to, for example, timber, they are not even looking at, they set up the boundaries globally. They are looking for sustainably managed uh, wood products. That means they really also take into account um, how the natural material was sourced, what impact it had. Have. And do you agree that should be part of uh, such a procedure? Will you start, Kevin? Uh, did you hear the question, Kevin? Can you can you hear us? Um, Pekka, maybe you can take the floor, please. Okay, I, I will answer from my side. Okay. I try to underline this LCA based of assessment, which means that you should do the life cycle assessment and then depending the location, whether the materials are local, uh, it's, there's no absolute uh, preference priority of, of steel, concrete, wood, composite, whatever. It's based on the LCA. One issue that is often there, another case study I made for this UN handbook was that was in Vietnam in, in Hanoi, I was following this UN procurement guideline and they said that it's only certified wood, wood that can be used there. The problem was that in, in Vietnam they didn't have certified wood and strictly following this guideline it would mean that they should import the wood from other places, which means that uh, increasing then the environmental impact, which means that often you should also establish like local uh, assessment or certification schemes in order to, to use the local materials. So I'm underlining this issue of using the uh, local materials when possible and of course this transport is one of the issues that is also counted when making the LCA. Then what comes to these distributed systems, I was mainly talking about these energy production systems and district cooling systems and others that are more efficient than individual solutions in, at the building level. Okay, Stephen, I unmuted you. You had a question about... Um... Yeah. yeah, go ahead, please. Stephen from uh, China Environmental and Certification uh, Center and I'm, I'm from the Department of Climate Change. Stephen, can you please As a get closer to the microphone? We cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me? A little better. Okay, so I will move a little close to the micro yeah, uh, microphone. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, this is Steven from uh, CEC in China, and uh, I'm from the Department of Climate Change. 
and uh, we can do uh, both the climate change related uh, verification and the certification, like the uh, project based uh, CDM and also the uh, uh, low carbon labeling. And also, uh, we have involved in the uh, environmental labeling, which has something to do with the uh, green public procurement. And, and my question is uh, how can we, as a company, uh, get involved in, in this new pipeline? And do, do you have any uh, thinking to, to do some demonstration work uh, in, in countries like China? Uh, Stephen, can you please uh, precise who um, is your question addressed to? As uh, I had some problem in uh, in connecting the, 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 the hearing the the, the the report, so uh, I think it is it, it would be a, a a rather general question maybe to to the city and lifestyle unit as as a group. <laughs> Um, we, we really we can't hear you very well. Uh, what we will do, we will collect all the questions and then we will write you back so that we can exchange um, and you know provide you answers. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, this is Pekka, can I have a pretty quickly answer okay, generally please. in this Thanks. question? I think all the 10 YFP programs are looking at demonstration and piloting projects and, and by contacting the secretariat I think we should in, we could investigate the opportunities of demonstrating and, and validate these things. Okay, so it will be through the residence uh, residency uh, of UNEP in China maybe. Right? If you contact the 10 YFP secretariat, your question will be addressed to the right programming question and that can be then discussed more in detail. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from uh, Imen Ben Soya. I will unmute you. Okay, um, you can you can speak up. Imen. So the question is um, from Iman from Tunis International Center for Environmental Technologies. Um, his question concerns the accessibility to databases related with LCA in the field of building and about certification schemes or equitable cr criteria existing in this field. If I answer that, if I answer that shortly, since the production of and construction is, is always local, it should be based on local databases. But then there are some average data that you can get from Europe or other sources. But that's also we can discuss more in detail. Um, Stefan speaking. Yes, I, I just want to add also that the question raises uh, uh, crucial items at the end, because having data and to be enough, let's say, measurable at the end, it's something to, to be it's crucial for the whole process. So the question raises something, but at the end, this is a process to create indicators and to be in position to measure. So even if you don't have data, you can rely on international scheme. And by the way, you are creating your own data step by step. And the process also, as soon as you go back to the global perspective of buildings as well as city, is that also you will have to enlarge the boundaries. And this is also some things as a trend to organize within a country. And I know that Tunisia is very well organized and uh, really well advanced because you have a building code, you have also a national agency to be in position to collect. So I would say all, let's say, the, the, the stakeholder has to at the end contribute 
to create a database to be accurate enough to demonstrate not only the material aspect but also the operational of buildings and also the refurbishment and the deconstruction of materials so this is the whole process to be connected with data and this is also an option to create links with climate finance and all let's say additional mechanisms to support the process on the financial aspect okay thank you very much uh, stefan so i think that we're going um to to end this webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, let me remind you again that this webinar has been recorded and we will make it uh, available on the SCP Clearinghouse YouTube page. We will follow up with you shortly with a follow-up email where you will have all the links uh, to the recording and to the uh, presentation itself. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for attending and uh, we look forward to meeting you again for our future webinars. Goodbye.